day that I was here, it felt like yesterday. But the good feeling is I feel like I'm at home. So it, it, it really is so good to be back here. I think I'll move to New Mexico. <laughs> I just love the city and this church. You just walk in and you sense the presence of God, the hunger, the anticipation. I couldn't wait to get back here, so what a joy. Thank you for having me, and especially tonight as you do Lessons 9 and 10. Is that correct? So I'm just going to start with a spot test from Lessons 1 through to 8. <laughs> no pressure. Just kidding. <laughs> Didn't you hate it when you went to school and they'd throw a spot test and you were unprepared? I was never prepared even. <laughs> even when they prepared us, I was never prepared. <laughs> so um, I'm just kidding. Um, the reason evangelism is so important to me um, as part of this curriculum is if you remember the the core values, the essentials of what I'm trying to accomplish through these 15 books that you are studying. And the first is, number one, that we'll be lovers of God. And that love is born in the appreciation of our new creation miracle, being born again, having been forgiven much. We love Him much. We love Him because He first loved us. And so we are today the product of His grace, of His mercy, of His love, of the sacrifice that Jesus paid by going to the cross and doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So we want to be lovers of God. And the difference between religionists and the new creation is religionists have a form of godliness. They're trying to earn their acceptance and their approval with God. Ours has been given to us by what Jesus did. We are already fully embraced and affirmed in Him, in His love. And so we start by being lovers of God. And if you are lovers of God, then His business becomes our business. His priorities become our priorities. And whatever is important to eternity becomes important to us because we don't think like the world. We don't live like the world. We don't speak like the world. We are the product of the new creation. We, the old is passed away. Behold, all things are new. Which brings me to how I came into understanding the importance of the gospel. I think I shared it when I was here in May, but um, just before I was uh, born again and um, I was on my way to movies with my girlfriend and we were walking hand in hand and I had long flowing blonde hair, which is greatly diminished. <laughs> and um, I'm in about the same shape as I was back then, just awesome. Um, but we were walking, and I had this blanket coat that my tailor had made, and I looked so cool, and we were walking, and there were these Christians on the street handing out tracts and singing, you know, and just worshiping, witnessing, and they gave me a tract, and I remember looking at it, you know, I, I don't even know what it, the way to salvation or something, and I said to my girlfriend, I crumpled it up, and I threw it over my shoulder. I said, you'll never catch me doing what these people are doing. The next week I got saved. Two weeks later, there I was. This is the day. This is, would you like one of these? <laughs> when you're a new creation, the things you thought you would never do suddenly become important. It's like Saul on the, on the Damascus Road. There he is trying to destroy the church, and three days later he's trying to build and advance the kingdom of God, the new creation, because you love God, what's important to him becomes important to you. The second core value and priority of these training is that we'll be loyal to our church. And the reason, and I, I, I could, and you've, have you done the glorious church yet? No. Not, that's coming up. To me, this is a critical element because we are not just saved into a personal relationship, we're saved into a corporate relationship. 
Everyone thinks, you know, and this was the, the, the phrase of the evangelicals, they would say, you know, when you give your heart to the Lord, you come into a personal relationship with Jesus. How many of you have heard that? That's only half the truth. And that's the problem why there isn't a loyalty in the church, because everyone thinks that if I'm right with God, I'm right with God. But if you're wrong with the church, you're wrong with God. And you see that with Saul on the Damascus Road. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting these crazy Christians. Well, when you touch these, you touch me. So whatever you do to them, you're doing it to me. And so we're not just saved into a personal relationship. We're saved into a corporate relationship. And that has been Jesus added them to the church, those who have been saved. In other words, authentic salvation is to be added to a church where you belong, where you are to mature, develop, and be discipled so that you can fulfill your destiny and calling. And if you're not right with the church, you can never fulfill your calling, your destiny. And so we are brought into a corporate relationship, and I want to instill a great love for the church. And I know everyone gets wounded along the way, things go wrong, relationships get messed up and the waters get muddied, but just because things go wrong in the church doesn't mean that it is not His. He said, I will build my church. The church is His bride, His possession, His value, His treasure, and so even though things go wrong, it doesn't matter that, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that people have failed. And we've just got to be careful that in their failure, we don't become the extension and be failed. And so we have to walk in grace and forgiveness. And, um, and so, you know, for me, loving the church is exactly the same as loving the Lord. <clears throat> you can't say you love the Lord and hate your brother. You're not born of God. So when you love him, you love the church. And so we want to be loyal to the church. He's loyal to the church, so much so that he said, where two or more gathered in my name, church, there I am. So he shows up at every meeting. He comes expectant. He comes with anticipation because he loves the church. And we just like, okay, Sarah, Sarah, what will be? We come in with this casual attitude, and, and yet it's his holy possession. Number two, loyalty to the church. Number three, guess what it is? Passion for the harvest. If you lay your head on the breast of God, you'll feel his heartbeat. You'll feel his love. And if you feel his heartbeat, it goes something like this. Souls, souls, souls. It's not my will that any should perish, but that all should have everlasting life. It's his desire that all have everlasting life. How will they hear without a preacher? But unless you have laid on his breast and felt that passion that he has, it will never become your passion. And so that's why this training is so essential. It's about being awakened in the passion that God has for the harvest, that we unify with his vision and his passion. And so that's the third core value. The fourth is important, and that is to be spirit-filled. I prefer saying God-possessed, because, you know, there are many people that speak in other tongues, but they're not spirit-filled. They leaked out a long time ago, but occasionally they speak in tongues. There's a huge difference between speaking in tongues and being filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with the Spirit, you're led with, by the Spirit, you're empowered by the Spirit, you're doing the works of God. And so there are many people that were filled, but they've emptied out. So Paul writes and he says, do not be drunk with wine where is, where in is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. He was speaking to Spirit-filled believers. In your being filled, stay being filled. So we want to live in that place of constantly accessing the presence, the power, and the anointing of God, because it's not by our works or by our energy or by our might, but it's by His Spirit. 
And true effective evangelism is not just handing out a tract with four spiritual laws or the Roman road, but it's operating in the dimensions of the power of God, the gifts of the Spirit, the wisdom of God, the gifts of the Spirit activated in your life. Where does it work best? Not just within the walls of the church, but out there where it counts. And so we want to be spirit-filled, but we also equal and parallel to being spirit-filled. We want to have godly character because people don't know us by our miracles. They know us by our character and our personality. And, and so we want to be authentic. We want to have integrity. We want to have um, compassion. We want to have bro the the yieldedness or the brokenness before God. We want to have the servant heart. We want to have excellence of ministry. All these qualities come equal to prophesying, working miracles, speaking in other tongues. We want to pay our bills. We want to be on time. We want to conduct ourselves excellently before the, the kingdom as well as the secular world. And then number five, we want to raise up a generation of leaders. If you lead someone to Christ, what does that make you? A leader. <laughs> if you lead them into discipleship, what does that make you? A leader. It's influence. It's influencing people. Now, here's what I believe. Our first priority is to be worshipers of God, to know Him, to enjoy Him, and to worship Him. And everything that we do flows from that walk with God. We call that walk with God our faith. Faith is not just the acquisition of things, it's how we conduct ourselves before the presence of God. It is our relationship. The stronger your relationship, the stronger your faith. Weak relationship, shallow relationship, or communion is probably a better way because if you're a son, you're a son. If you're a daughter, you, you have a relationship, but you may not have intimacy. You may not have fellowship. So the stronger your fellowship, the stronger your ministry. So um, leadership all flows from your love for God, your worship of God. So in that is where you established. The second ministry that the believer has, guess what it is? The ministry of reconciliation. The new creation has been given the ministry of reconciliation. I don't know where it is in the book. Uh, it's probably chapter 2, maybe chapter 3, where I deal with the new creation miracle, the new creation mandate, the new creation message. Is it chapter 3? Just have a look for me. How many of you remember that? 2 Corinthians 5, the new creation mandate, the new creation miracle, the new creation message. And, and that's the ministry that we've been given is that we actually speak on behalf of God. I urge you, be reconciled to God. We become His voice. How will they hear without a preacher? That preacher isn't standing behind the pulpit, but it's our personal ministry, firstly to the lost, and then discipling the found. And I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. So just understanding that your ministry is to become leaders, influences, leading people to Christ, leading them in discipleship, leading them to be assimilated in the life of the church. This is where leadership begins. So your first priority is to know God, to enjoy God, and to worship God. Your second priority is to reach the lost at any cost, because that's what flows from the heart of God, is the harvest. And so it is our priority. It is also our privilege. You know, what is a priority is not something God's like forcing down our throats. It's something that we assume, like Jesus was faithful in all the Father's business, so we assume this responsibility. And I, and I kind of loathe to use the word responsibility. I prefer to say responding to his ability because it's Christ who's at work in us both to will and to do. So whatever I'm doing, it has been God-infused, God-breathed, God-given. And Jesus said the things that the Father has given, I do. What he has spoken, I say. So everything he did flowed from the heart of the Father. And so we are the continuum of what Jesus began both to teach and to do. And we are his voice to this generation. This generation of sinners 
is the obligation and the responsibility of this generation of saints. If we don't reach this generation, you can't blame the devil, you can't blame the politicians. You have to take personal re re responsibility and say, the buck stops here. Well, that would be quite handy if it would work in our political system too. It's easy to say it, but you know, maybe that's a, 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 an example. They say the buck stops here, but it doesn't. They always play in the blame game. And that's what the church does. Well, someone else will do it. Someone else will go. Someone else will pray. Someone else will give. We're always trusting that someone else will do it. But what are we going to do about this generation of sinners? And so when I formed this uh, ministry, Global Ministries and Relief, I wanted to come up with a mission statement. And I wanted something that revealed God's plan for both the church as well as for the harvest. And so I coined this phrase, re, um, our ministry exists to reach the lost, to disciple the found, and to build the church. Reaching the lost, discipling or equipping the found, building the church. Because if you reach the lost, you're building the church, essentially. Although that has to be re-established because Many people today lead souls to Christ personally, and then they kind of fumble their way and say, well, just find a good Bible church. Now, think if you were just one minute old in the Lord, and someone says to you, find a good Bible church. Well, the Roman Catholic Church has Bibles. The Methodist Church has Bibles. In their mind, every church has a Bible. So they'll just choose any church, but you know not everyone preaches the whole gospel for the whole man. Not everyone preaches the truth. So we've become embarrassed to promote our church, to assimilate new, new believers into the church. We're kind of like, it's like, have any of you ever been in sales? If you've ever done sales, there comes a point when you ask for the order, is there anything stopping you from signing? Many Christians get to that point and then they start fumbling. They're scared to actually bring people to a point of decision. And then once they do sign on the dotted line, they kind of like walk away. Well, God bless you. And the person's left standing a piece of, a piece of paper in their hand. Hey, now what? I'm right with God. If I die now, I'm going to go to heaven. They have no idea. And so I've called this the work of follow-up, chapter 9, the work of follow-up. And I use the word, and on Sunday morning and Sunday night, um, I'm going to deal with um, the topic that I've entitled, The Doctrine of Works. <laughs> it's the most untaught subject in the church. We teach on the doctrine of grace, but no one ever teaches on the doctrine of works. Brother Hagen said ministry is spelt W-O-R-K. Well, he was wrong. It's spelt H-A-R-D space W-O-R-K. <laughs> so, I want to, and of course, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. However, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so, follow up, and I use that phrase, I may rephrase it in time, the work of follow up. When I got saved, and you certainly can't preach your example and testimony, today I am the product of the cross, of the blood of the work of the Holy Spirit, of someone's prayers, someone's writing, someone's paying for the chairs that are sat on, the buildings that are walked into. Someone has paid as well as what Jesus paid for me one day to enter into the church, into the community of faith. I'm not self-made. I am the product of His making, but also someone else prayed for me. I'm sure my mom prayed for me. <laughs> I know she did. <laughs> But many prayed, and they needed to. <laughs> I was so bad. Anyway, um, when I got saved, I, um, I was in the church, and it, 
It wasn't the friendliest church, and I know that I was the odd man out because the, the Pentecostal church back then in the early 70s was very conservative. And I had hair down here, torn jeans, and sandaled feet, and a t-shirt that was my favorite and my only, and uh, my <laughs> Volkswagen uh, camper with my bed and my beads and my incense and my stack of surfboards. I was very cool, but certainly not Pentecostal by any means. So when I walked into the Pentecostal church, I was like the odd man out. I was like a, I, I stood out like a sore thumb in a carpenter's convention. Um, so uh, they didn't embrace me. They didn't love me. When I went forward to receive Jesus, the, the pastor said, if you want to receive Jesus, come up quickly. Now I was a hippie, but I'd been in the military for 10 years. So when he said, if you want to receive Jesus, come here quickly, quickly to, mean, to me meant Get up there quickly. So I ran. And I stood in front of him. Pulled my head. Straightened my beads. And, and he said to me, he leaned over and he looked at me. And he said, you're an enthusiastic one, aren't you? And I interpreted that as, you've been condescending to me. And I don't like you. I wasn't even saved and I was already thinking murder. I'm about to ask Jesus into my heart, and I look at the guy, and I think, I'm going to pull you over this pulpit, and I'm going to break your arm off, and then I'm going to rip it off your shoulder, and I'm going to stick it down your throat, and you'll eat your own arm. This is what I'm thinking, and I'm about to get saved. You can see I have anger issues. <laughs> So this is exactly how it goes down. I'm standing there, I'm fuming, and I'm thinking, what are you doing here? These people don't even like you. He's dissing you, and I'm thinking murder, and I'm not even born again. I need help. So this is how it goes. He says, well, if you want to receive Jesus, go with this man. And he points like that, and I think, I see your arm coming off again. You're going to eat your other arm. So they lead me into this back room, and the place is a mess. Now, I'm a hippie, but I'm not a dirty hippie. I'm an ordered hippie. My car was cleaner than that room. There were boxes and old clothes. It was a mess. And I stand, I'm looking around, and even though I'm a hippie, I'm thinking, geez, this place needs cleanup badly. Surely, the church is me. I know nothing about church, believe me. And I'm thinking... If this is God's house, surely they would respect it more than this. this is, I'm not even saved, and I'm already criticizing the preacher and the room. <laughs> so this is exactly how it goes down. The usher who took me to the back, or the elder, whatever he was, he says to me, well, if you want Jesus in your heart, kneel down and pray a prayer. This is exactly the exact words. Kneel down and pray a prayer. And I'm thinking... Your son was in my classroom, and he was a nerd. And, well, we didn't use the word nerd. I was thinking other thoughts from my military days, but I can't say that from the pulpit, especially over the air. And I'm thinking, <laughs> one day, he was being bullied, him and another guy, Ivor Rotenbach, who ended up being a full gospel pastor himself. They were both being bullied and, uh, because of their faith, and I wasn't even a Christian. And I walked in and I took on a whole gang of guys to deliver them from being beaten up. <laughs> and yeah, this guy's father that I saved from being beaten up says to me, well, if you want to get Jesus in your heart, kneel down and pray. So I'm about to go down and pray. And I have this open vision, my Damascus Road encounter with Jesus. Thank God because I really wanted to commit murder, and I wanted to clean the church, and I wanted to beat the usher up. <laughs> I come out of the prayer room after this encounter, and uh, my friend, who later became my father-in-law, he says to me, so what did Jesus say to you? 
He was just a brand new believer. He had never been to church in his life. His dad was an atheist. His dad grew up the product of the hatred of the Welsh revival. He was a total atheist, and uh, so he was never allowed to go to church, but he was trying to find God, and he went to a youth rally, this old dude. Now I'm like triple his age, but he, he went to a youth rally and got saved, and then he took me to church, and he was like so on fire. Now I would never have gone to church, except I liked him as a friend, and he said, please come with me. Okay. So anyway, we, we go to church, and I get saved, and I walk out. He says, what did Jesus say to you? I said, he's called me to be a preacher of his word. He said, are you going to be a pastor or an evangelist? I don't know what those words mean. I don't speak Christianese. I'd never heard the word evangelist. I'm serious. I did not know the word evangelist existed. Are you going to be an evangelist? And I'm thinking, I don't want to be a pastor because that guy wanted to break his arm off. That's the last thing I ever want to do is lean over the pulpit and talk down to someone. I don't want to be a pastor. I said, I'm, I'm going to be an evangelist. <laughs> I didn't even know. I lied. I came out of the prayer room and I already told my first lie. Anyway, him and I would read the Word and pray, and we were both just days old in the Lord, and, and then I was baptized in the Holy Ghost one night while I slept, and I woke up speaking in other tongues, and my next-door neighbor, Wendy, was my dear friend. We had her, her boyfriend, and I were, he was my surfboard maker, and I gave him a lot of business. I went through surfboards like people go through computers or cell phones or stuff. I mean, I was, if I got a ding in my board, I wanted a new board. Even, I, I was sick. I needed help. When I went on honeymoon, I took my dog and I took my surfboards. I bought myself for a wedding present a brand new surfboard. <laughs> and then I was punished by God, I'm sure, because I was driving through this thunderstorm it was like the clouds came down. It was like tornadic. And my roof racks were ripped off with my brand new surfboards. And I watched in the rear view mirrors. My boards went flying down the highway. I pulled the car to a standstill, my Volkswagen. I jumped out and I ran down the highway, lightning crashing. My boards, my boards, my boards. And I died. Oh, don't need minor scratches. <laughs> my new my new bride sitting in the car. What have I got myself into with this guy? Anyway, I was a mess. But Wendy was like me. We, we partied together, her boyfriend. And we, I mean, we were just like part of that culture, that group. So I woke up 6 o'clock in the morning. Well, I was awake from 2 o'clock, but I couldn't wait till any longer. At 6 o'clock, I said to Bridge, Go knock on the door, get Wendy to come in here. And Wendy came in, and I'll never forget, she had this blue uh, gown on, you know, long gown, and her hair was still bedhead, and uh, all wrapped up, and her eyes were half asleep, and she's sitting opposite me, and I said, Wendy, I need to tell you about God's love. I didn't know that when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit that you speak in other tongues. I woke up speaking in other tongues. I didn't know what that meant. I, did, I didn't know what tongues was, but I woke up speaking in other tongues. But I also didn't know Acts 1.8, you shall receive power and you'll be my witnesses. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit 2 o'clock in the morning. 6 o'clock in the morning, I led my first soul to Christ. Wendy LaRue was my first convert. And I didn't know the Roman road. I didn't know the, the spiritual laws. I just said, God loves you, and this is what he's done in my life, and he wants to do this for you. And I had the privilege of leading her to the Lord. Anyway, since then, by the grace of God, I've led well over a million people to the Lord. Many of them started personal evangelism on the street, in the bars, in the brothels, on ships, everywhere. When Jesus said, go into the, the highways and the byways, I literally took him at his word, and I went wherever there were sinners. And um, we would go uh, straight off to work, which was pretty cool. I was a, 
full-time lifesaver on the beach, and I lived right across the road from the beach where I walked, worked. So I'd go to, I'd go to work in my speedo, because <laughs> that's what South African lifesavers do. In my speedo and my cap, and my flip-flops, and my surfboard, I'd go work, and then I'd come back, and when there weren't bathers, I'd be reading the Bible, and then we'd go and we'd, we'd have a quick bite to eat, and we'd be out on the streets till midnight preaching the gospel, and then we'd bring our new converts to our house, our apartment, and we'd sit around and we'd, we'd share the word with them, and, and I didn't know that was discipleship, but I just started doing what I thought needed to be done. Then... I wasn't really growing, you can see there, there was a lot in my life. I was passionate, but I didn't have a lot of knowledge. So one day I went to the pastor and I said, I was reading in the Bible, how we to go into all the world and make disciples. And, and I said, so as a church, what are we doing about this? And I'll never forget the moment he stood there and he looked at me. And he said, we used to do this, but it doesn't work. And I said to him, and I'm just days old, weeks old in the Lord, I said, as far as I know, we're a full gospel church. And this is part of the mandate that God has given to us. Whether it works or doesn't is not our responsibility. If he said, go, that's what we must do. Then he said to me these words. I'll never forget them. He turned and he looked at me. He said, we don't do this here, but there is a group down the road that's doing it. Why don't you go join them? I didn't get the hint. I said to him, no, I'll, I, I'm going to stay here, but I'll go learn from them. Then I'm going to bring it back here. <laughs> and I could just see him grow pale and this look of sheer horror come across his face. <laughs> he really didn't like me. <laughs> I was so hungry for God. If he had told me, cut your hair, I would have done anything he told me. But he was just irritated with me, everything I did. Anyway, so I went and joined that group, and I learned how to do evangelism. But there was a man in this church where they didn't like me, Arthur Morris, Arthur and Phyllis Morris. Remember I said I'm the product of the cross, but I'm also the product of Arthur and Phyllis Morris. One day after church, they walked up to me and said, we can see you hungry for God. Why don't you come and have supper with us after church, and we'll share some things with you. So, hey... I'm a surfer. I can eat six chickens, <laughs> six hamburgers. The water in South Africa, besides being shark infested, is cold. I would say damn cold, but that would insult you. It's so cold that you'd stand under the shower for like an hour just to try to get your core back up under hot water just to get core. And, and then I'd eat. I could just eat anything. That's why when I went in my 80-day fast, I really needed 80 days of fasting because I could eat anything, and I did. <laughs> anyway, it's another story. But um, so they offered me food, and uh, yeah, I'll go for food anytime. So we went to his house or apartment, and, and Arthur and Phyllis began to teach me the word. They would show me movies with A.A. A. Allen and Catherine Kuhlman and Oral Roberts, they introduced me to Dake's Bible. They taught me how to read the Word, how to study the Word, how to pray in the Spirit. They explained the baptism in the Holy Spirit to me. They spoke to me about spiritual warfare. They taught me that I can cast out demons and heal the sick. I am the product of the cross, but I'm also the product of Arthur and Phyllis because they discipled me. They discipled me. They loved me. They taught me the Word and helped me find my way in the Christian faith, in the Christian walk. And um, when I needed adjustments, Arthur would be bold. He'd speak to me as a father, never mean, never critical, but he'd put me right. He'd encourage me. And, um, and so I believe in discipling because I was discipled. Not in a discipleship program within the church, because here's the truth, and it's sad, but Arthur and Phyllis weren't really loved in that church because they cast out demons and that church didn't like it. And they thought they were a bit fringe and weird because they cast Mark 16. These signs shall follow them who believe. Uh, again, full gospel church. Well, here's another story about the church.
So this guy by the name of Bert Singer, he's a Jewish, Messianic Jewish brother, Bert Singer. Uh, he worked with Ruth Heflin the, and, and came out of Jerusalem. And um, he came to our city. And he began to teach on dancing before the Lord. Well, you would say dancing before the Lord, dancing before the Lord. So he showed in the word how David danced with all his might, how his wife, uh, Michal, looked down at him and, you know, the, the after effects. Anyway, so I started to dance before the Lord. Now, you've got to know me. I don't dance. I didn't dance at my wedding. I'd never danced at parties. Even if I was drunk out of my skull, I wouldn't dance. I would stand in the corner and think, who could I beat up? I never wanted to dance, ever. Even when they said, well, you've got to do this one dance around, I said, I refuse. When I was best man for my brother-in-law, they said, you've got to dance. I said, I refuse to dance. I will never dance. And then I encouraged him not to get married because they were going to dance. I said, let me take you away. And I took him surfing, and we got to his wedding like an hour and a half late, and our hair was still wet, and we were in our wetsuits, and we were getting dressed to run in. The, the, I, I knew that wedding wasn't going to be successful and the marriage wasn't going to be successful. I tried to help him, seriously. <laughs> I was truly a best man, <laughs> but I wasn't successful. So um, I never danced, but I started to dance before the Lord. So I'm, I'm dancing in church, and the elders pulled me aside. They said, we don't do that yet. So I said, well, we full gospel. We raise our hands. Doesn't that in the, in the Old Testament as well? Yes. We shout. We say amen. We clap. Yes, yes, yes. I said, well, they danced. Well, okay, but you're not allowed to dance around the communion table. <laughs> So Bert Singer taught me to dance, and uh, he taught me to cast out demons, to heal the sick. I am the product of other ministries, and hopefully what you're going to get out of this is that you're going to see there is a work of follow-up that needs to be done, whether a program or whether just by assuming the obligations of the Great Commission. The Great Commission has got four verbs. Who knows what a verb is? Doing word, action word, doing word, we say in South Africa, doing word, something that you do. So what is the, Matthew 28, it's part of your scripture memory, go into all the world, make, baptize, and teach. Those are the four verbs, am I correct? Go, make, baptize, and teach. Now, three of those are supportive to the imperative. Guess what the three are? Going, baptizing, and teaching. Guess what the imperative is? Making. Guess what we do? We major on going, we major on teaching, we major on baptism, we don't major on making disciples. The state of the church is where it is today because we don't make disciples, we make converts, we make decisions, we make people have a, almost a false sense of security. Pray this prayer and you'll make it into heaven. The Great Commission was never to go and reach the lost. The Great Commission was to go reach the lost and to disciple the found. And that's where we've gone wrong. And when you disciple someone, you teach them, you baptize them, you raise them to spiritual maturity where their gift and destiny is awakened in God, then you have done your job. Jesus wasn't big into numbers. You remember when the crowds grew, he made outrageous statements like, eat my flesh and drink my blood, and poof, they were gone. And he turns around to the disciples and he says, are you also going to leave me? And Peter looks around and he says, we would, but we just don't know who else we could go to right now <laughs> as he's fasting in his Nike running shoes. <laughs> Jesus said, follow me and I will make you. And after three years of intensive making by Jesus, save Judas, 11 of them were the founding apostles of the church, 
Of course, then he had the 70 and the 120 and, and the 300. But essentially, he worked with the three and he worked with the 12 and he made disciples. And, uh, and so we see that that was what his ministry was about. And, and again, Church Growth 101 is make disciples. If you can make convinced disciple means convinced follower, convinced student, persuaded. This isn't some casual signing up for a two-year Bible program. This is a way of life as a student of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the making of God, using men and women to shape, to mold, and to help you iron sharpening iron. Twelve on one day plus a hundred and what's twelve minus a hundred and twenty? Where's the mathematicians here? Yeah, that a number. <laughs> Three thousand were added. One miracle later, besides being added daily, five thousand are added. The disciples were growing at an, at an incredible rate. And here's the thing, if you just, and look at the, the quality of commitment, they met daily to pray, to care, to share, to study the word. As a result, an environment was being created for God to move and souls to be added. The Lord was adding to that environment. We need to get back to making disciples. So this course is not just about reaching the lost, it's about discipling the found. And there is a work to follow up. Now, the imperative of the Great Commission is to make disciples. It is a work that means it takes effort, it takes determination, it takes discipline, and it also means Work will actually take you out your way. If you look at someone's car that is in a mess. The other day I did a camping trip and it rained, bugs. I came back, unpacked all my camping gear. It took me two hours to clean my car in Florida heat. You know, um, if you want a clean car, it's going to take you out your way. I could have sat in the air-conditioned house and said, hey, wait for a rainy day, put the car out there, and hope for the best. But I'm, I'm highly disciplined. It's called stewardship, so I wash my car, I get it cleaned, but it took two hours, and it took me out my way. I was drenched when the car was clean. I was drenched. I was, I was exhausted from two hours of working in that blazing heat. Ministry will take you out your way. It's inconvenient. And, and so it's the same. If your yard is uncut and the edges are uncut and the weeds are there, it's just a, uh, it says, I don't want to go out my way. I'll rather sit in front of my TV in an air-conditioned environment and just enjoy life and uh, what the neighbors think. It doesn't matter. I'm just not going to go out my way. Ministry will take you out your way. Soul winning will take you out your way. Disciple making will take you out your way. And we are all busy. But when it's a priority, your busyness becomes aligned to the will of God. So it means that you've got to change. And so Jesus made disciples and the process of making disciples is critical. I, I have set the goal to raise up a million world changers, disciples, students. I'm at somewhere 250, 280,000. It's hard to keep up with it because it's exponential. You know, churches, Bible schools grow all the time. But what I'm trying to accomplish is to raise up world changers, not graduates. But world changers, I mean, if you go into your world as light, love, power, the gospel, that world is going to feel the impact of your life. That world has changed. Your world may only be 10, 15, 20, 30 people, but that world will know there's a living God in the land and His name is Jesus and you representing Him. So 
I want to raise up world, lead, world changers. The way I see it is, number one, I want to make you a believer. And so, of course, I'm going to reach you and lead you to Christ and then develop you in your personal walk with God and your, your, your corporate walk will come into it in the next point. But I'm going to make you a believer and teach you how to read the Word, water baptism, I'm going to teach you about baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to teach you about prayer, about giving, about your, your, your obligations uh, towards God. Once that has been established, my second stage is to make you a member, to assimilate you into a life-giving relationship with the community of faith. Because I know you cannot make it on your own. You have to have people around your life. The old story, take a coal out of the fire, it grows cold. Together, we are better than separated. Now, you are personally responsible for your life and your ministry and your walk. You can't put the blame on the pastors, on the church, on the organization. You have to take personal responsibility. But when you analyze it, we also take responsibility for those around us. We encourage one another. We stimulate them to good works. We pray for one another. We submit to one another. We honor one another. All the one another's come into play in this corporate identity. And so I'm going to build you as a believer. Then I'm going to build you as a member. I'm going to teach you what is church. We know Christ by revelation. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but... It, but by my Father who is in heaven. So Peter received revelation of who Jesus was. Who am I? Prophet, teacher, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjohn, flesh and blood has not revealed this. So we can only know Christ by revelation. Revelation comes by someone sharing the word with purpose, and the Holy Spirit, faith comes by hearing, and then the Holy Spirit is drawing, so they come into salvation by revelation. But here's the thing, we know church by culture and tradition, not by revelation. And so people embrace church the way, the way they did in their Christian culture, where you go, depending on your family, you may go to weddings, funerals, Christmas, and Easter. You may go whenever there's an emergency, a crisis. You understand? But it depends how you were shaped to the way you understand church. Many people think church is, we employ the pastor, we tell him what to do, how long to preach, where to go. People have this mentality. We are a community run by committees and teams, and they don't have a revelation of the gifts, the callings of God, and how we are structured biblically or revelation. They know it by culture. That's why when they receive an offering, they give according to tradition, not according to revelation. There's no faith in it. And then if you preach faith, they think you after their money. You're teaching the principles of the kingdom, how to live in this dimension of the spirit. So anyway, people are critical of the church because they only know it by culture and tradition. They don't know it by revelation. If we could pull back the curtains of the flesh, the veil of the flesh, and we could see into the spirit, people would have a whole different view of church, right. of themselves, if they viewed themselves according to the spirit. So they know themselves according to the flesh, and they know one another according to the flesh. They don't know them by revelation. So I want to get people to be in the community of faith as a strong believer and as a strong member. Then my next level is to train them to become ministers, which is soul winning, intercession, their gifts, their anointings, their abilities being brought to the forefront. And then from there, I will take them and make them a leader. Leader not being position or title, but influence that they are fathers and mothers and uncles and aunts and, and in business and in society and in the schools and the, the sports, the, the, the arts, wherever they go, they are leaders, they're influencing people. People are like drawn to them because there's this magnetic attraction of their anointing and the way they conduct themselves that they elevate people, they inspire people, they're leaders. And then once I've made them a leader, then I want to make them a reproducer or a disciple maker. 
You see, that's where we want to go. We don't want to just reach the lost. We want to actually raise up disciple makers. That's a whole nother ball game. So the work of follow-up is about getting people established in a personal walk with God, a corporate walk with God, then a walk in the Spirit in their ministry and calling and gifting, and then using it, becoming fishers of men, influence, leading people to Christ, leading them into deeper realms in God, and then we'll change our world. And so that's my goal, is to make disciples, and um, not just students, but to make disciples. Now, in your, your first book that you studied was called Discovery. And you'll remember right up front, one of the goals was that in the two years that you're studying, number one, I want you to reach one soul a year. Now, of course, that's aiming so low, even if you're really not even passionate. You can lead someone to the Lord. Just wait for someone to be dying or sick or just go lay hands. And before you lay hands on them, say, hey, if you die, you're going to go to hell. Would you like to get right with God? Anyone can do that. <laughs> I've got good news and bad news for you. The good news, let me leave that for last. The bad news is you're going to hell. The good news is God loves you and you can escape. <laughs> and so we want you to win one soul to the Lord each year that you're a student. However, that's not all. We want you to then take that one soul and to disciple them to walk them through discovery yourself, to teach them about salvation, assurance of salvation, the Bible, prayer, water baptism, baptism in the Spirit, their victory against sin, the flesh, and the devil, and the world. And if you could just instill those few things into them and then bring them into the church, think about it, that this church would be filled in the two years just from your evangelism and discipleship. Forget about those who move into the city and looking for a church and people that transfer from one church to another. Just think if you reached the harvest and discipled someone. Now, we can criticize Mormons and, and um, Jehovah Witnesses, but they have a strategy. They're strat they are strategic. We are not. We're like haphazard. They're intentional. They come and they, if they can get their foot in the door, what they're going to do is they're going to come into your home and they're going to do Bible studies with you. And let me tell you, their Bible study programs are full. They are running around because they have to. They've got to get their numbers in because they may make it to the 144,000 if they can do enough. <laughs> they can get into the homes, but Christians can't. People say, oh, I can't go into someone's home. We're just bought into the lie. If you are persuaded and you can share hope and life and you carry the anointing, people say, please come to my house. Right. Or you say, come to my house if you're embarrassed to bring them into your messy house. And if at the worst, just take them to a Starbucks. <laughs> no, let me tell you, I was, I was in St. Louis before COVID. I was preaching there, and I, I stopped on my way to church to pick up a cup of coffee. You've all heard about my addiction. It's not like news to you. <laughs> I love Jesus, and I love my coffee. And someone said to me, well, I wouldn't buy from Starbucks. Listen, I don't buy their politics. I don't buy their policies. I just want the flavor of strong coffee. If I can find someone else that makes it like that, I'll support them. <laughs> but I can't support Dunkin' Donuts with a pure conscience because it's weak. <laughs> they buy the, the used coffee beans from Starbucks and they repurpose it. <laughs> And you pay half the price, I understand, but it's because it's used already. <laughs> Seriously, 
I was on the mission field, and this person comes to me, and they've got this bucket. I said, um, we've got a gift for your Bible school students. These are used tea bags. And, or, you know, they've only been used once, so there's still at least another cup in each bag. I looked at them. And I said, you know, whatever you give is going to come back to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. You're going to be so prospered with used tea bags for the rest of your life. You will drink tea until the day you die, but it will be tea that has been drunk by someone else first, and then you will have the leftovers. And I say the same when they bring their used furniture and they use beat-up cars that they no longer want, and it's good enough for the ministry. And their 15-year-old computers on DOS with floppy drives. (laughs) Yeah, I want to bless the ministry. No, thank you. We are not your garbage drop-off. Go pay for recycling and look after it. As you can see, I'm passionate about these things. Anyway, yeah, how did I get into coffee? Starbucks. I was going to Starbucks. Thank you. I knew where I was going. I was going to Starbucks. I walked in, and there's a man. You know, they've got those long tables now in Starbucks. They used to have the little ones, but they found they can cram more people in pre-COVID. Now you can't get in at all unless you wear a mask and you drive through. But anyway, that's another story. So I walk into Starbucks pre-COVID, and there's a man, and he's got the table surrounded with men. And, and he's teaching them the word. I sit down and I listen to the guy. He's like teaching them to be fathers, to be husbands. And they all new and young and he's turning in the word, teaching them. And I'm thinking, that's what it's all about. If you can't take them to your home, take them to Starbucks. Take them somewhere and meet with them and teach them who they are, whose they are, what they've been given. And how they're not just to start, but how to finish. Many evangelists lead millions to the Lord, but 2% are retained and enter the church. Something's wrong with that math. The Lord added daily to the church those who have been saved. Something has gone wrong with our system that we can make decisions, but we cannot get people to come to church. Well, number one, we can't get Christians to come to church. Because they don't know it by revelation, they know it by culture and tradition. So if they do lead someone by chance to the Lord, they don't even love the church. So why would their converts love the church? So we have to change our thinking about these things if we are to succeed and win our generation. And someone's got to do it. This generation of sinners is the responsibility and the obligation of this generation of saints. And with that, I'm going to give you time to break. Who's going to close the session and then give you instructions?